Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back. This is episode 326. Happy New Year. I hope you guys all had a great holiday. It's wonderful to be back. I want to say a special thanks to Brother Greg and Frodero for coming on that last episode 325 if you didn't listen to it you got to go back and check it out it was fantastic in the news just want to let everybody know that i am making some very huge headway on a book that i'm hoping to release this year the book is essentially about the occult anatomy but more so the deciphering of occult anatomy and an item that we found frodero and i and its relation to how the occult anatomy is practiced and it should be a wonderful book for anybody who's into that kind of thing it's a largely a book of symbology so even if you don't subscribe to occult anatomy kind of stuff you'll find the book fascinating i chose to write the book not as a masonic book but as an occult book of sorts the audience for it is essentially anybody interested in symbology. So I would urge everybody to uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter to get updates on that book as they release. Um, As we get closer to the release date of the book, I will, of course, release a few excerpts of chapters here and there, and hopefully you guys all enjoy. It will be a print book. I doubt I will do an e-version at first, just because I really feel that the book deserves to be almost in the university style of a book. So we'll have images within the book that have entire huge plates of the occult and Anatomy and some of the symbols. So I hope you are as excited as I am about it. Additionally, I want to tell you guys all about a project that I started quite a while ago when John Ruark and I had talked about the list of lodges by by the the, the publishing company here located in Illinois. It's a wonderful book. Uh, My only problem is is that I wish it was mobile sometimes and I wish we had all that information in our palm of our hands. Uh, What typically happens is they produce a limited amount of these books and they go out to lodge secretaries and then there are very few left over. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if every mason really had access to this? And there's some apps out there that do this and they're very great apps. Grand Lodge Illinois has got a pretty good one, Masonic Connections app, but overall I think it would just be great to have everything for every state in the palm of your hand and largely this is information that's just out there anyway. If you go to any Grand Lodge website you can look through their list of lodges, find a lodge by zip code or whatever. So I went to every single Grand Lodge website and I pulled down lists of all the lodges in all the cities and all their numbers and I have all of their information, whether it's Prince Hall or regular, uh, whether they have Prince Hall recognition or partial recognition, their founding year, the founding dates. I've got everything in here that I can possibly fit. And I turned it into an Excel-based slicer tool. And I would love for you guys to take a look at it. Go to wcypodcast.com, click on Digital Lodge Listing USA Beta. This is, again, just a beta thing. I pulled all the information from Lodge websites, Grand Lodge websites. So I didn't get the information. I'm not pulling it from anywhere else. So this should be very up-to-date. There are some states that don't have the data in the right format for me to pull it into the Excel. So I would have to like manually type everything. So my ask is that you go and you check this out. And if your lodge is listed or your state has information in there, cool, enjoy this. But if not, if you have something that has the list of lodges or perhaps it's some sort of digital version that you type up and you can get to me, I can add it to this. This is a free tool that I just wanted to put out there for everybody. Full disclosure, this works on iPhones pretty well. Android, it's a little spotty. It is an Excel slicer-based tool that works in an embedded kind of atmosphere. It does allow you, if you click on it, you can go to the Microsoft 365 page and operate within another window. It allows for you to actually download this. It is locked, so you can't get into the data behind the scenes, but you should be able to really get into this and check it out. So I hope it's a tool you guys want to use and you guys enjoy it. But again, my real call out here is if you're a lodge that's not listed, if you're one of the states that's not here, please, like if you click on, for instance, Nevada, I have nothing for Nevada because the website has information there, but it's not able to be pulled in. So if you're in Nevada, shoot me uh, an email. And this goes for anybody who's Prince Hall too. There's only a few Prince Hall Grand Lodges that I was able to go to websites and find a listing of lodges. So if you are a Prince Hall member and you've got a list of lodges in your state that's recognized, shoot them over just in an Excel format if you can. I'm just looking for your state, 
the city, name of the lodge, and number. And that's all I really need. Um, it, it's bonus if you can tell me if it's Prince Hall Recognition or the Grand Lodge website or anything like that. I have nvmasons.org is the Grand Lodge in Nevada, but in any case, it's out there for you. I'll stop going on about this. Uh, just go there, check it out. Let me know what you think. Go ahead and leave any comments there. It's a blog post, so it's just embedded. Just I just want to also say now, thank you to everybody who's been on Masonic Curators. Uh, we've got a, a great thing going here. We are really coming up with some awesome content. I've got a lot of stuff to show off, and really some of it is kind of show and tell, and I've got some small stories behind this stuff. But the ones I really enjoy are the ones that come from other members, like Greg Knott, who gave us a tour of Homer Lodge, which was just incredible. We also had a wonderful piece by Stephen L. Harrison, who brought us his dad's apron case. Yes, I know his apron case. That sounds weird. You got to see the video. It's amazing. Uh, we've got some great ones coming up from Stephen L. Harrison again, and also Greg Knott. But if you're just a guy out there, you've got a cell phone, you can take a video and just do it. Don't be shy. Tell us about it. We're all brothers. Really, this is what it's about. We're sharing those things that we have a little bit of uh, nostalgia for as we've got a story behind these really cool items. And we'll go and we will post on these things, you know, three times a week. Typical releases are Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. But if we start getting bombarded with videos we can go monday through friday guys just more content out there we are sharing uh, those things that bring us together as masons with that just please check it out masonic curators you can go to masoniccurators.com or you can go to curators.wcypodcast.com either one will take you to the website or you just go to wcypodcast.com and click on masonic curators uh, just please go ahead and like and share the channel we're trying to spread the light as it were so all that said you know, I don't know what that was, maybe 10 minutes of yapping about all this stuff, but it's a new year. We've been off for two weeks. It's great to be back behind the mic again, talking to all of you. And we're really excited to keep things moving forward. And the first piece I've got for you is a piece that has a few references in it. And I think it's really important to listen. There's two main ideas within this post, and I hope you recognize both of them. And it really speaks to a couple of items. And overwhelmingly, it's where are our brothers. So this one is called, O Brother, Where Art Thou? And it's by Midnight Freemason contributor, Worshipful Brother, Darren Loners. The first article I wrote for the Midnight Freemasons was about my trepidation on becoming Worshipful Master of my Lodge. I wrote out my mission statement and emphasized how I wanted to make the Lodge a place where brothers and their families wanted to spend time. I've been trying unsuccessfully to arrange some events for the brethren to get together socially. My last two attempts have had attendance from myself and one other member and Midnight Freemason. Our November stated meeting barely had enough members for a quorum to open Lodge. Granted, I knew that we had had a few members that had other obligations due to their familial obligation, but I still wonder, is there something I'm doing wrong? The writing has been on the wall for some time. We've seen declining interest in events such as Workers Club. My junior warden has received a wonderful opportunity to continue his education, the downside being that his class meets on Thursdays, which means he's been missing some of our stated meetings. My senior warden has a job which requires a lot of travel, so I'm lucky that he can make the stated meetings, but he doesn't have much time to make other events. On top of this, we just won our second place for lodges under 80 members in the state of Illinois for our Grand Master's Award of Excellence. All this adds pressure to try to make sure we do equally as well next year. But still, it makes me wonder, why aren't many of my other brethren as concerned about keeping the high level of excellence we've set? Worshipful brother Scott Duball just wrote a really interesting article regarding this. In it, he challenged the incoming leadership of his lodge as an outgoing master regarding creating a membership-centric plan for the lodge. His main points were eloquently summarized as, one, identify where the lodge has gaps in and what needs to get done. Two, identify brothers with those talents. And three, identify ways to attract the interests of those brothers. In my home lodge, we are particularly lucky to have three members that work in a kitchen of a local restaurant. Our food, when we have degrees, is spectacular. I'm not taking advantage of this as master. We should have food before our meetings at the lodge instead of meeting just a few brothers for dinner prior. Masons like to eat, right? But this only really applies to brethren that want to be active in the lodge. The question remains for me, how do I attract inactive members to come to Lodge? I came up with a short survey. As I just sent it out, I have no idea how it will be received. I have no idea if anyone will reply to me. I'll share the results in a future article. However, the survey is below. 
One, if you are not currently regularly attending the stated meetings, what is keeping you from coming? Personal reasons, work, family, etc. Lodge is boring. I've forgotten the passwords and I don't want to embarrass myself or I feel awkward attending by myself. And I have better things to do with my time. Number two, what would make our lodge more attractive to you? More family events like dinners, picnics, etc.? More educational programs? More fellowship activities? Going bowling or other group activities? Dining together? Socializing as brethren? Focusing on doing community service slash charitable works in our community? Three, what would attract you to come to a stated meeting? A nice dinner prior to the meeting in our dining room at the lodge? Guest speakers? Notable Masonic scholars and the like? A short meeting followed by fellowship off of lodge property at an establishment that serves adult beverages? Or nothing. I'm just fine paying dues. My struggles led me to think about how we select members. There seems to be two fundamental philosophies regarding prospective members at play within Freemasonry. The first philosophy is based upon a fear that we are dying as an organization and we need membership. If a man meets the basic criteria for joining the lodge and petitions for membership, assuming he meets this criteria, he should be allowed to join. We need bodies to pay dues and to pay per capita, and as long as they are doing this, it's fine if they don't engage in the lodge. At least once a year, I hear one brother in lodge talk about how electing a candidate to receive the degrees of Freemasonry should be a mere formality. The same brother thinks that we should never throw a black ball or a black cube in Illinois because by the time a candidate has his petition balloted on, that he's already been thoroughly vetted by at least six other brothers. The three brothers that have signed the petition as well as the three more members that have served on his investigation committee all have essentially vouched for the petitioner. So the petitioner's election at that point should be given and anyone who has an issue with the candidate should have addressed it to the lodge prior to the vote. However, I think we all might have a regret of not throwing a cube at some point during your Masonic journey. I personally have had two candidates that I thought long and hard about blackballing. I didn't do it. I didn't do it because their top line signer was and still is a personal friend and a Masonic mentor. But I often wonder, should I have? The two candidates in question now are absent from lodge and we are chronically chasing after them to pay their dues. I regret not doing it in retrospect, but what does that make me? I feel complicit in the situation. The other fundamental philosophy is that we need to make masonry somewhat elitist. This idea is based upon a thought that we should only admit men that have a desire to improve themselves and dedicate themselves to the craft. It also argues that we are not maintaining our historical identity by letting every man of good character join. It believes that we are essentially causing the status quo to be lowered because we should only allow men that are going to act towards being morally and intellectually superior. If we institute some form of entrance prerequisite, we will separate the wheat from the chafe. We must guard the West Gate against men who do not share these ideals. This idea has come up again and again in discussion recently due to a recent post by illustrious brother Chris Hodap. If you've not read it, I suggest you do so. While I caution against elitism, I don't think that it's necessarily a bad thing to re-examine ourselves as a fraternity. Sometimes a good hard look in the mirror reveals flaws that we've been ignoring for far too long. Yes, we need to attract a certain type of member, but I wonder if the Westgate had been strongly guarded when I joined, would I have made the cut? Would you have? But then again, had it been guarded more strongly after I was a member, would I have the same issues with lodge participation that I have today? I guess there are questions that can't be answered because the past is set in stone. We can only decide for ourselves, at our local lodge level, what we want to be going forward in the future. Each individual lodge is different. Each member is different. I can only state for myself that I have become a better person due to the lessons of my degrees. I can only say that I feel blessed for the friends and mentors that I have made along the way. I can only state that Freemasonry has unlocked a desire to write and to create, which lie asleep inside of me. I would hate to take that opportunity away from from another man who is just as qualified as I was for Freemasonry. However, I also believe that I need to be protective of the craft. So I will end this with this. We are given the power to ballot as a master mason for a reason. Don't be afraid to use it to protect Masonry if you feel a man is unworthy or will prove himself to be so. Just be sure to use it responsibly. Darren A. Loners, Worshipful Master, St. Joseph Lodge, number 970, St. Joseph, Illinois.
All right, there you have it. There were a couple points in that paper where I thought, wow, I can't believe he's going to go into this area. But I think it's important to understand that he was actually just outlining two distinct philosophies in masonry. And he really tied it together at the end by saying, I don't know what the answer is. I want to protect this more. I think we need to protect this more. And perhaps that just comes down to the dynamic of your local lodge. What kind of lodge is it? Is it a service lodge? Is it a philosophy lodge? And Really, if it comes down to the fit of the man, let's say the guy is great, but it comes down to the fit of the man, we should probably point that man in a direction to a lodge that more suits his abilities or his talents or what he's looking for. If he's not into philosophy, maybe he's into, you know, service, then maybe there's a lodge that's locally that does better with service work. But also the reverse is true. If it's a service lodge and he's very philosophical minded and you know he's just going to hate it, then it's time to tell him you should check this lodge out. In fact, let's go there at their next meeting and I can introduce you to some brothers. But then there's also this other underlying theme which involves somebody who probably shouldn't be a member in the first place, a criminal perhaps. In the state of Illinois, we admit men that have felonies, but that's because the lodge has voted and said, look, this guy, the felony to which he was convicted was of this nature. There was nothing really wrong with it, or it was silly, whatever it is. There's context. That's what the investigation is for. But then there are other grand jurisdictions, like I believe in Pennsylvania, where there's a background check run, and if it comes back with a felony, they're just not even allowed. But then it goes beyond just criminal activity. Does somebody have the moral character that should make them a Mason in the first place? All these things we have to take into consideration, and it's a huge undertaking, and anybody who served on an investigation committee knows that we could do better, and just how difficult it is. Next up, I want to go into this week's Masonic Minute with illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison, and after that, we'll go into another great piece, so stay tuned. William Shaw born sometime around 1550, is best known as the great master of works to James VI of Scotland. As such, he was responsible for overseeing all royal castles and palaces. Having the complete trust of the king, he also served him in several other capacities, including accompanying him to Denmark to return with the new queen Anna of Denmark. Within Freemasonry, Shaw is best known for setting forth the first and second set of Shaw statutes to be observed by all the Master Masons within the realm. He issued the first set in 1598. Written as a part of his responsibility as Master of Works, he directed both statutes primarily to operative masons. However, these are among the first documents alluding to the esoteric and speculative aspects of the craft. The first set of statutes specifies 22 rules and regulations designed to govern the work and behavior of master masons and their apprentices. Many of the rules set forth a penalty for disobedience. These regulations call on all Masons to observe and keep all the good ordinances established before, to be true to one another and live charitably together, and be honest, faithful, and diligent in their calling. In it, he admonishes Masons never to undertake work they can't perform, nor take away another master's work. He limits the number of apprentices in a lifetime to three and prohibits the selling of apprentices to other masters. Shaw also outlines rules governing the resolution of grievances and stipulates penalties collected shall go to charity. The second Shaw statute, written in 1599, establishes in order Edinburgh, Kilwinning, and Stirling as the principal lodges in Scotland. It establishes the election of the wardens, deacons, and secretaries, and outlines some of their duties. It reaffirms the use of fines for charity and dictates exclusion of all who fail to live up to the statutes. It requires every fellow of the craft and apprentice to demonstrate his skills annually 
and forbids association with Cowens. The inscription on his tomb bears the most reliable source of his biographical information and reads, This humble structure of stones covers a man of excellent skill, notable probity, singular integrity of life, adorned with the greatest of virtues, William Shaw, master of the king's works, president of the sacred ceremonies, and the queen's chamberlain. He died 18th April, 1602. Among the living he dwelt 52 years. He had traveled in France and many other kingdoms for the improvement of his mind. He wanted no liberal training, was most skillful in architecture, was early recommended to great persons for the singular gifts of his mind, and was not only unwearied and tireless in labors and business, but constantly active and vigorous, and was most dear to every good man who knew him. He was born to do good offices, and thereby to gain the hearts of men. Now he lives eternally with God. His tomb also bears what may be the earliest Mason's mark. It is a complex sculpture of all the letters of his name, and S, C, H, A, and W, inscribed over a square in compasses. His epitaph concludes, Queen Anne ordered this monument to be erected to the memory of this most excellent and most upright man, lest his virtues, worthy of eternal commendation, should pass away with the death of his body. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. All right, I hope you enjoyed that piece on the Shaw statutes and William Shaw. Always some amazing content there. Just some of the laws that Steve talked about, selling of apprentices and this kind of thing. Just fascinating. So once again, a huge thanks goes out to illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison for his awesome talent and taking the time to do this for us. You guys aren't going to believe some of the cool stuff he's got lined up for Masonic curators. Uh, he's got a rather, sh he's got a short one coming up, but he's got some other things on the back burner as well. It's just a matter of time, you know, as Masons, we are busy. So of course we appreciate again, all of the time illustrious brother Harrison puts into this. So thanks again, brother Harrison. Next, I've got another great piece and let's go into that right now. This piece is entitled A Lodge at Work by Walter M. McDougall. Brother Walter M. McDougall is a member of Piscatonicky Lodge number 44, Milo M.E. and a past Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Maine. Brother McDougall is faculty member at the College of Education, University of Maine, where he teaches philosophy. Brother McDougall also authored 6-95 Short Talk Bulletin, Surprised by Joy. A lodge is a certain number of Masons duly assembled with the Holy Bible square and compasses with a charter or warrant empowering them to work. Ask a brother how his lodge is doing and his answer is very apt to be either that things are going well because there has been a lot of work to do or that the life of the lodge is at a low ebb because there hasn't been much work lately. 10 to 1, he is talking about degree work. There is no doubt that performing degrees is a vital part of the work of a lodge, but it is a common short circuit in our Masonic thinking to conclude that exemplifying our degrees constitutes the work of our lodge. Degree work is a means, not an end. Another possible and closely related short circuit lurks in the word jurisdiction. In our everyday Masonic usage, this term signifies the geographic area from which a lodge draws its candidates. Just as the work of a living lodge embraces much more than doing degrees, so there is more to the concept of a lodge's jurisdiction than the place a lodge draws its candidates. The workings of a lodge of Freemasons is a many-faceted business which takes place not just within a lodge hall or just among its members, but within the lodge's jurisdiction of compassion and service. Suppose we find ourselves standing outside the Builder's Lodge in a place called Needsville. Here, according to our ritual, gathers a certain number of masons duly assembled, inspired by the sacred book and guided by the compasses and the square. They are, by a charter, empowered to work, that is, they have the honor of laboring as Freemasons. On reflection, we realize that Builder's Lodge, like all Masonic lodges, exist 
even when there are no Masons meeting in the building. It exists in the shared belief system of the Brethren and in their united endeavor to give concrete evidence of their beliefs through their service to others. Every Mason who has received his training in Builder's Lodge should know that the dimensions of his lodge spread symbolically to the ends of the earth and that nothing short of universal compassion is the aim of the fraternity. In more immediate terms, the dimensions of, of Builder's Lodge spread across Needsville to the borders of the lodge's jurisdiction. Jurisdiction defines a certain community of lodge members and wayfaring brethren alike. It is a community within the community at large, a community of the craft alive and operative. As in the case of the Masonic terms work, and jurisdiction, the word lodge, with its varied meanings, may cause confusion. Your wife asks you if you will be at home this evening. No, you answer, I'm going to lodge. In this response, lodge means a place and an event. You are signifying a communication of the officers and brethren at the lodge hall. Such usage indicates a partial manifestation of the lodge, but in this last instance, Lodge identifies an entity neither limited to a particular place or to a special event. Put simply, Lodge meetings represent a vital and special function of the larger Lodge, which is the local community of Masons. The Lodge Hall houses the operating and training center for this larger Lodge. It houses the nerve center, if you will. From this place of focus, the leadership of the master, assisted by his officers and his communities, radiates outward and assumes the responsibility for putting the craft to labor within the lodge's jurisdiction of compassion and caring. These officers are the future masters in training. It is in leadership training, instruction on how to build an administrative team, and in schooling Masonic educators that our Grand Lodges play their most essential role. Consider the extensive dimensions of the Lodge's mission. This labor falls into three categories, all of which are interrelated and partake of the vision of the craft. A. Care for the Masonic family, B. Serving the needy and building a better community, and C. Training the builders. Quote, Take care of the widows and the orphans. End quote. This is the great charitable charge we have received from our operative predecessors. This noble charge still stands, but it has been expanded to the entire Masonic family. Our obligations have enlarged with our growing conception of what we as Freemasons came here to do, and as new needs have demanded. We feel it our wider calling to support the aging members, the young Masons laboring to bring up their family amidst an enlarging circle of dangers, and our youth who may find their first introduction to the great beliefs of humanity within our youth organizations. Who are we as Masons if we do not look after our own? But there is more. What do we understand about our work? if we curtail our mission within our Masonic house. We come to the work upon a fairer city of humanity. This is what we intend to do. It is our vision to bring a new era of hope and joy within our Lodge's jurisdiction of compassion and service. It is the result of our calling as builders within our given jurisdictions of compassion and service which constitutes the work of our Lodges. We all like to see a large number of brothers out at our meetings for, after all, fraternal companionship is one of the great joys of Freemasonry. However, it is not the primary business, or even the business at all, of the master or his officers to entertain the brethren in an attempt to populate the quote-unquote sidelines. Lodges at one time may have served as places of entertainment. They may properly do so now, from time to time, for happiness is part of the business. But the lodges are not primarily about sidelines. They are about main lines of action and vision. Masons, even those who seldom attend lodge meetings, are duty-bound to practice and to live as Masons within their own Needsville. Recently, I had the opportunity opportunity to present a 50-year Veterans Medal. As so often is the case, the receiving brother began to apologize for not having come to Lodge more often. When he was done, a young Mason rose and said, Don't you apologize. I watched you all these years. I was growing up in the community, and I wanted to be like you. You and your life are why I'm here. It is the master and his officer's duty to see that the living of Freemasonry throughout the jurisdiction is not haphazard. Every member, according to his time and his capability, should be given some part to play in the work of the Lodge as it promotes the human conversation, as it conciliates true friendship, as it stands for the justice and equality, and as it, quote-unquote, restores peace to the troubled minds. It is from the nerve center of the Living Lodge that such direction and leadership of the craft must come. All this is implied in the phrase, a Lodge duly assembled, coordinated for the accomplishment of its work. All successful lodges are operative lodges. Find such a lodge and you will discover leaders, or a leader, who knows how to bind the brethren in a significant expression of the Masonic enterprise and who has the skill to set them to accomplish this purpose for themselves. Perhaps we have not given enough thought 
to how much skill, how much informed art such leadership demands. And this, too, must be primary in the concern and the services of a Grand Lodge to its lodges. Perhaps we have not sufficiently considered how much sophisticated skill is demanded if we are to help create within the community that communication, networking, and coordination which is now required in the building of a better world. Certainly, we all tend to forget that below all that we do, welling up and giving strength to all building endeavors, are those moral principles which illuminate and stimulate the Masonic vision. So now we return to where we began this exploration of a lodge and its work. We find ourselves realizing why our degree work is a vital means and not an end in itself. At the quote-unquote nerve center, the officers and those members who possess the special gift of being ritualistic teachers assemble to set another man upon the degree journey, that greatest of gifts which the lodge has to give a brother. One man at a time, heart to heart, mind to mind, the craft builds its working force. The meaning which gives significance and purpose to the builder's life and to his labors must be discovered. It must be journeyed after. This is the purpose of the degree journey, and this is the work of the degree givers. To share the old guideposts, to go in companionship as far as a brother can go, and to celebrate the new understanding and dedication found. The Brethren of Builder's Lodge have a vision to give to Needsville. In giving that vision... The brethren themselves will come to understand its immense value through the work of the Lodge, which is going on within its jurisdiction of compassion and service. And the brethren will be drawn back to that nerve center. In that sacred retreat of friendship and virtue, they will find the quiet joy of renewal. When the sacred book is spread and the working tools displayed, there will be created a special place apart from the press of time and the urgency of life's demands. It is a place we name Our Lodge. It is a place from whence we go out, renewed and shoulder to shoulder, to work again. And that's the end of that amazing piece. I hope you enjoyed it. Some really empowering words within that one. That piece in its entirety will be available via the show's app. So if you don't have the app, go ahead and go to your Google Play Store or go to the App Store. Download the Podcast Source. It's an application put together by Liberated Syndication. Once you have downloaded that free app, you can go in there, search for Whence Came You, just spell it all out. Sorry, you can't just type in WCY. Uh, type in Whence Came You and you'll see it. Just click install and that's it. It just gives you, it's a huge listing and then you have access to all of the papers, all of the wallpapers that we provide. This paper will be right there waiting for you in the palm of your hand. Maybe you can read this to your lodge and really, you know, read it a few times, practice it, give yourself some emphasis and it's a really great charge for your lodge. So check that out. I hope you were inspired by it. That's it for this week. I just want to thank everybody who has been donating to the show month after month who are our our regular contributors, fellows, and producers. These guys, without them, we really couldn't do this program. So thank you so much for that. If you want to contribute to the program, but you don't want to do a monthly donation, please consider doing a one-time donation. You can do that on our website. There's the PayPal information right there. Give any amount that uh, you feel like, dollar, five dollars, whatever it is, it really assists in the production of the show. Every dollar goes right back into the production and serves to keep all the episodes available for everybody all the time. And it makes it possible to do some of these extra little things that we do, like a digital list of lodges available for everybody without the need for an application or anything. It's just right there. And we're going to make that better right now. This is just in beta form. So just think about that kind of stuff. I really appreciate everybody out there who also goes to our little store there and picks up our WCY pin. If you get that pin, take a picture of it. Tell me where you are. Tag us on Instagram and tag us on Facebook. Show us where you wear that pin and and uh, really just to help share the light of this program and share it with your brothers. So with that, if you enjoy Masonic Podcasts, I know you do. You're listening to this one. Please don't forget about the Masonic Roundtable. We go live every Tuesday at 10, 9 central. Uh, we've got a great program coming up this upcoming week, just in a couple days. If you're listening to this on January 7th at 930 at night, this Tuesday, we're going to have a conversation about the pomegranate on the Masonic Roundtable. You're not going to want to miss it. What could be so crazy about a pomegranate? Well, there's a whole lot of symbolism within that, and we're going to deconstruct it. In addition to that, of course, again, like and subscribe to this on YouTube, as well as our Masonic Curators program. Send us some videos, and don't forget about the Midnight Freemasons right? We have a tireless group of people who are continually writing and giving you excellent content. From time to time, I'll throw my hand in the mix. Admittedly, I'm not as great 
as some of our uh, contributors who pretty much blow me away every time they write something. So please check that out. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, new articles, for the most part, all new content. So have at it. And until next week, I hope you guys all have a fantastic time, and I'll talk to you all then. So stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.